Hi Priya, good afternoon. How are you? I'm good, Abhay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Lovely Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Priya. Thank you so much. I remember our past conversations, and I couldn't have been more excited talking to you. Same here, completely. Yeah. completely and especially agree. about an uh, area which seems to be a buzzword with everyone. And honestly, oh, yes. I could not have chosen a better person to speak about this. So what we will focus Priya today is around zero trust. So let me put a disclaimer to everyone listening. I know very little about zero trust, right? But I hear a lot about zero trust. So today you are the expert. So all, and I'll leave you with this one small note, Priya. I believe zero trust is a framework. Yes. What does this exactly mean? Explain it to me. Okay, I'll. Like you said, this is the most spoken about uh, terminology in the last two years, especially during the remote workforce uh, days and now hybrid workforce days. There's so much emphasis on zero trust. Right. I, I'll, I'll put it in simple words. It is, it's not so complicated. It's a simple architecture framework, which is built or should be built on a principle of never trust, always verify never trust anything no okay. implicit trust okay. and explicit verification that's what zero trust framework is all all about and it applies to accesses authorizations enablements devices data sharing you know all and each and every operation that's that that happens within an organization's uh, network so what we're talking about is replacing implicit trust with explicit permissions and verify it every time and 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 stop threats from moving within the network. That's what Zero Trust is all about. Very succinctly put, Priya. Thank you so much. So, Priya, uh, what you just said, would it be right for me to infer that this is somewhat in lines with what we used to traditionally know as identity and access management and taking it over and beyond the traditional realms of uh, perimeter uh, network security? Absolutely. It is... It is, let's say, next level of identity access management. In fact, uh, most of the organizations who have been on the journey of zero trust in the last mm -hmm. couple of mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. have all started uh, with putting in place a robust identity and access management framework because we are talking about basically don't trust anything and uh, verify every time. No mm -hmm. implicit trust and explicit verification, which all starts with identity and access right. management. Right. authentication stricter authentication me measures multi uh, multi-factor authentication measures and then authorization but what we are now saying is don't just limit it to people but it does apply to devices it does apply to data access don't just right. restrict it to people and applications but extend it to every access point within the network and extend it to non-human identities as well and try and verify as much as possible at the network and perimeter level so it's 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 it goes beyond perimeter security like you said and also takes the overall framework of identity access management to a complete whole new next level to make it sound very simple uh Priya, thank you so much but help me understand with one thing see when we talk about enterprise security every company has it's a journey right you may be extremely mature in that journey or you may be starting off now typically yes. for a company which is probably say infancy of this journey, how should it be ideally taken? Can an organization manage this on their own, or do you need to do you need to have a support of a specialist like a system integrator or a vendor support? How should one plan to go about this? There is uh, this once again no simple way of saying what works or what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's all about you know achieving zero trust is all about. Uh, uh, all about having control over visibility, context, and understanding the business goals. These are key to successfully achieving uh, zero trust. So uh, it's it's not needed that organizations go for a rip and replace model. That right. will typically those will be typically long haul projects, and uh, you know they may not be guaranteed success, and they are also costly, and may not fit for every size of organization. What's important is aligning the roadmap of zero trust, have a vision of zero trust and align it with your enterprise's IT roadmap and 
and the pace should be adjusted in such a way that uh, it, it aligns with your current and future IT and security uh, maturity levels. Where do we want to be? If your IT maturity level that you're expected to be is at a level three or level four, align your zero trust also along the same lines. And it's very important uh, to understand who we are catering to when we are talking about zero trust control controls. Are we focusing on customers, employees, your yeah. branch offices? What are your business priorities? Um, how are they going to impact? Uh, how is your zero trust going to impact where the data is stored? Um, what are the points from which accesses are coming in? And uh, and are we able to continuously know? who is creating risk and are we focusing zero trust on those aspects once these uh, moving parameters which are also the critical success factors to have a successful zero trust model implemented if these are figured out then there are definitely various solution design options to choose from you know those which are which are cost effective which doesn't mean a complete rip, rip and replace of what we are trying to do but focus more on practical goals and implementation and I I would personally suggest uh, once again whether to go for an SI or do it in house also depends on organizations way of approaching IT and security today if they are done in house today if they are handled in house today then there's no reason why they should uh, uh, they should go for an SI or if there's already if they if they already have partners in place then they are the best people to enable uh, zero trust but the clear vision should be in place why are we doing zero trust how are we doing it and what are the pains and risks that we are going to address once those are figured out if there are technology in place today similar technologies can be used to implement zero trust um, there are there are many uh, seamless zero trust integration products and solution options that are available in the market uh, today and there are there are various ways in which it can be enabled and this once again no right or wrong way in terms of doing it in house as during or using an si but whoever is managing your infrastructure and security today is best place to bring in seamlessly bring in zero trust into it however organization will have to have a careful vision and roadmap in terms of how they want to achieve it and guide their partners accordingly we yeah, love your you know a uh, candid response but and i have a question here you know uh, and I, I speak on behalf of your PA community here. See, when we talk about zero trust, and it's it's quite natural for any industry to join the bandwagon and try to maximize in terms of revenue potential. And I see a lot of vendors, you know, position their security portfolios around zero trust, right? In such a scenario, it becomes challenging for companies who have yes. existing security portfolios. How does a company gauge whether what I have in house is sufficient to build on the zero trust framework, or do I need to take the support of the solutions that are out there in the market? How do I take this very important step? That is, it's a very good question, and that's something that I very frequently uh, come across when I am speaking to my customers mm. as well. Mm. Mm. What's important, you know, when you are in that kind of a dilemma, it's important to do a a quick assessment of where you stand with respect of zero trust readiness. Are we okay. ready today? How mature are my zero trust controls? Hmm. That's, that's very important. You know, um, doing a quick assessment of what are the risks today, uh, the access risks, the attack surface areas, uh, accesses from inside, as well as your partners and remote employees. What are the uh, what are the devices through which the accesses come in? What are your critical applications and who all have access to it? A quick assessment of um, zero trust readiness, I would say. How ready are we for zero trust today? So, it, you, you know, organizations don't have to go by what the vendors are saying, existing right. partners are saying. Mm -hmm. and, and a, a best case to start with is do a quick assessment of zero trust readiness. Are my applications zero trust ready? Are my uh, endpoints from which the accesses are coming in, are they zero trust ready? Is right. my package zero trust ready? And my, um, uh, and my, uh, are my, uh, where I am storing the data, is that zero trust ready? And finally, networks, are they zero trust ready? If we do a quick assessment of these five or six areas, that's a very good starting point to figure out, you know, what are the gaps to be plugged in? And then, 
define the roadmap and then talk to vendors and partners in terms of uh, how to achieve it not not before because then you get to hear multiple versions and right 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 and priya uh, every technology and uh, as an analyst that's uh, that's one of the luxuries that we have you know uh, i've tracked many technologies and every technology has its actually is he right so what are some of the challenges with zero trust and i'm assuming there are few there there's there are definitely two or three challenges once again i come up first mm-hmm. okay. mm-hmm. what we are talking about is absolutely trust nothing and explicitly verify everything mm-hmm. which introduces a business challenge of 99.9999% availability right there's right. challenge and recently i i was speaking to one of the customers who are in the journey of uh, zero trust enablement but even before the implementation the first question that i am asked by business is even if everything goes down also i should be able to access the applications <laughs> because right. for them for them you know downtime is loss of business and right right everything that we are doing is to enable business growth not reduce uh, right. reduce revenue so that's a that's a very fine balance that we need to strike and the way the way i address is to have plan a and plan b and plan c and everything is fine if everything the way i address this is to look at you know in a in a full fledged uh, uh, full proof zero trust model this is how the actors are going to work and if there is a challenge this is this is my business continuity plan where we are going to give a restricted environment restricted accesses and business this is how business users still can still continue to access and then these are the services that will still be shut down that that adds additional costs and additional right right right, right. Mm-hmm. So it is not just with zero trust this is what happens with security it's a fine balance between um, ensuring security versus uh, ensuring productivity and not hampering uh, business continuity etc etc that's a challenge that continues to be there and the second challenge of course is the question that you already asked is it uh, how to bring it in without much investment you know how, how how not to go for rip and replace how not to make it a huge almost impossible task to achieve which is again which again requires careful uh, introspection careful definition careful road map and strategy planning and planning zero trust around the risks not just zero trust because i want to be zero trust today that's not how how one should go about it where are your risks and where are your crown jewels and define zero trust only for that we don't have to we don't have to do a uh, we don't have to boil the ocean focus on critical applications critical data and implement zero trust around those and then we have we predominantly address 99.99% tested so the, the challenge once again is the fine balance between zero trust versus business enablement business continuity and uh, business growth so priya one of the challenges that i uh, know of and i'm extending this uh, question of challenges is in you know, which which makes you know trust uh, what it is is around the concept of multi factor authentication right now conceptually it's it makes security watertight but what about the its impact on end user experience at the end of the day that's what we're trying to achieve by end user it could be a customer partner Or, or or an employee so what is your take on this that's a very good question something um something that uh, that i've personally solved for few customers i'll oh, tell you okay how. okay multi factor authentication is designed not around security but designed around end user experience then it can be a huge success and oh. it will actually help uh, uh, you know help the experience of users hmm. for example uh, we recently implemented multi factor authentication which was more of con- you know uh, touchless and passwordless kind of authentication as well hmm. for uh, for a healthcare customer you know these are okay. doctors who have to authenticate keep swiping everywhere they go they work across right. multiple hospitals especially because they are shared doctors they work across multiple right. hospitals right right when they go they have to log into the systems they have to remember the user id password of that um you know the hospital chain that they are working right. it's, right. it's 
two months and half the time they are making calls to uh, help desk you know four have 50% of the calls that the help desk was receiving was from either nurses or doctors who forgotten their password or don't even know their user id i am i am in communication what's my user id because that's not their their core job is to yes yes right right this scenario just imagine if we have been in, able to introduce a uh, multi factor authentication or a passwordless authentication where they don't have to log in and uh, uh, you know inter- inter- type in user id and password every time all they have is one token you just go on touching it everywhere and you are you are into the system and your work uh, uh, workspace is restored it's it's a huge user experience enhancement for them it's like it's like your day suddenly has become so 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 good that you look forward to going to work that's that's a that's a simple example of how multi factor authentication can really help user experience simple case of what microsoft did with microsoft authenticator there were so many authentications that were required before now all you need is one authenticator app on your right. phone right. and you're ready to go across all microsoft platforms all you have to do is every 14 days just do your face id on your authenticator app and you're done and you're ready to go so multi factor authentication can be a huge enhancer of end user experience if designed and implemented right if it if the design surrounds end user experience not it, it should not surround enhancing security let's not just focus on security enhancements let's focus also on end user experience then it can be a huge 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 success now i and i mean this genuinely i love the spin of how you put this completely differently the way i saw it so far you know i mean it's so nice to put when you design it around end user experience suddenly it makes a lot of sense you know yes. you know where where the where the person is intended to be using this makes it i mean it's like you know the biometric scan i don't let to remember anything so i'm designed intrinsically to be secure so yes that completely so security some areas directly affect end user experience and some areas are behind the scenes like what right. we do on 24 bar 7 operations or even zero trust architecture enablement where we are doing network segmentation uh, software defined architectures those are those don't directly affect the end users this is this happens behind the scenes we are trying to protect their interest but they don't physically feel it but there are certain areas that directly affect end user experience and those have to be uh, those have to be designed keeping end user experience in mind not just security which may be the case for other areas which are purely you know security for security but this is security for end user experience love the examples that you shared uh, yeah. that's it for today thank you so much uh, i would i wish we could speak for hours at end and i hope we get a chance to do that in the near future but for today pleasure talking to you as always thank you so much same here up like thank you so much uh, yes uh, it, it, it's it's always very interesting uh, having a conversation with you would look forward to more conversations in future thank you so much for having thank me you. thank you thank priya you. thank you so thank much you.